Hello everyone, welcome back to The Distracted Gardener. I am Charlie, The Distracted Gardener. This is a gardening adjacent podcast where we talk about some amateur science and uh, personal stories and we will occasionally actually get into gardening itself. Uh, Today what we're going to be talking about is fungus. Now, uh, when I started getting into gardening uh, three seasons ago, so that means, what, three years, three and a half years ago or so, I started to hear a lot about this idea of uh, mycorrhizal networks, right? This sort of underground network of fungus that was sort of, um, mm, uh, in a way I've heard it very interestingly described, uh, sort of internet of fungus that helps beam information, i.e., uh, carbon and other nutrients between plants and uh, turns out to be, you know, a very significant factor in healthy uh, ecosystems, but also can be, uh, can be, can be uh, used in the garden to help um, to produce healthier plants, healthier crops and all that kind of thing. Because I started hearing more and more about this um, when I had a chance to go to a store in Kyoto, a bookstore that had a good sort of wealth of not only English books, but books that were really aimed at sort of this kind of, uh, what would we say, horticultural science doesn't seem quite right, but let's say plant science. I was really excited to find Suzanne Simard's Finding the Mother Tree. And that was that was really what, what set me off and put me into the deep end because her work on the interconnect- uh, the interconnectivity of forests and the wild networks of fungus that work with and support them for blow open like a, just a whole new world for me. And it was strange because reading through how interconnected everything was um, in these forest ecosystems, it was almost like you, I don't know, it just seemed like, oh, oh, duh. It makes sense that things in the forest would work together in that way and sort of fit together in that way. The thing about Dr. Samard's book, Finding the Mother Tree, is that it was sort of very, well, in, in some ways, it's it's sort of like what I'm aiming for this podcast to be, I suppose, in that it was very much, I mean, there's definitely some science to it, right? And you definitely had something to learn there, but it was also a bit biographical, and it was about how she had grown up and how she had faced different challenges to get her idea about all this interconnectivity and, why can I not say that word? had too much coffee today I suppose Uh, but about like mycorrhizal networks mycorrhizal networks um to be taken seriously but the what I want to kind of talk about today this this sort of fungus right (laughs) which which is not something I I think I ever would imagine being so excited about but um anyway after reading Dr. Samard's Finding the Mother Tree I uh, one of the other books that I picked up actually when I was in uh California visiting my brother last year um, was Merlin Sheldrake's Entangled Life. Um, the subtitle of the book, uh, it is called Entangled Life, How Fungi Make Our Worlds, How Fungi, excuse me, Make Our Worlds, Change Our Minds, and Shape Our Futures. Again, the author of this is Merlin Sheldrake. Uh, before going any further, I feel like I'd be doing a great disservice if I didn't point out how cool of a name Merlin Sheldrake is. The This guy has like a perfect name for a wizard, uh, but I suppose, uh, given his field of interest, he's much uh, closer to a druid. Entangled Life uh, focuses on mm, not so much, I suppose, necessarily on on the symbiosis of of um, of just just trees and and fungus and stuff like that, but sort of all of the different amazing things that that fungus uh, do, sort of for the greater natural world at large, and all the things that they could possibly do for us, and. And it was just such an incredibly fascinating read. But as I said, whereas Finding the Mother Tree was sort of like, mm, it was it was a, it was a book written to be sort of readily understandable, I think, by by a mass audience. This this is definitely denser, and I found myself having to reread pass, uh, passages a couple different times or whole pages a couple different times, 
uh, to make sure that I that I really understood what was happening. But also that was not not only because I needed to make sure I, I, I understood what was being said, but also just because sometimes my mind was so completely blown by what I was what I was reading or or oftentimes for the first time, sometimes having some information that I had gotten elsewhere sort of reaffirmed, but uh, whatever the case was, there was just so much interesting things to think about. And so I'd like to share a couple of those now, I suppose. One of the examples, uh, and again, please excuse me today. Uh, uh, last episode, I had a bit of a sniffling problem. Today, I've actually, one of my ears uh, has decided not to work. So I'm only hearing out of one side of my head and it's sort of making me quite discombobulated in a, in, a, in a number of situations today. So I apologize. But one of the things that uh, was really interesting to hear about these sort of fungal networks, right, that are formed in this sort of a symbiotic relationship, uh, although not necessarily symbiotic between uh, plants and fungus, was fungus can help uh, plants to take up more, more nutrients. It can also facilitate the transfer of nutrients between uh, different plants in a shared sort of system. But one thing that was really, really fascinating to me was that not only will these fungal networks allow for uh, plants to to have like this, you know, this open market of of uh, goods uh, between them, it, it can also help them to sort of protect each other. You'll have to forgive me. I don't remember exactly what the example was that was given, but there was a there was an example. Uh, maybe it was just a, a type of aphid, actually that was attacking some species of tree in some woods, in some place. <laughs> and, um, you know, plants do this thing where uh, if they're being attacked by a pest, they will release certain like chemicals into the air that will allow other members of their species to know that there's a, that there's, there's a pest coming that's attacking them. And, and then those other members of their species will produce sort of... Um, my antibodies doesn't seem exactly correct, but defenses... In, in the form of chemicals and whatnot to sort of prepare for the attack of what was aphids in this case. And what was interesting is that it's not just like we said, like I talked about before, that, that fungus allow for exchange of, of mineral and nutrient uh, resources. It's also that they can help actually share these signals, right? So that's where it's really interesting how it, it, that sort of especially strengthens the, the, uh, the analogy of these fungal networks being very much like um, the the internet, where you know they're not only used to send uh, things, but they're also used to send signals and, and communicate um, in in a very very interesting way. So that really just really got me. Um, another thing that I suppose I suppose makes sense, uh, given given you know that penicillin comes from fungus, for example. But um, I was really struck by how incredibly adaptable. Uh, fungus are, and again, you'll have to forgive me. I didn't. I didn't write down exactly all of the, all of the fine detail. But basically, fungus, and of course, I'm I'm sure this probably varies based on species and whatever. But there are times when you can introduce things to fungus that they don't really like, and if you slowly introduce it to them, right? You slowly uh, introduce it over time. Eventually, they will not only sort of learn to uh, cope with uh, whatever that thing might be. They also do this thing where they'll they'll like <laughs> they'll make it like their main uh, source of food, right? Which is so crazy, right? Because like for example, you know you sometimes hear hear uh, like stories of of you know old kings in France or whatever who uh, regularly ingested like small amounts of poison. Uh, the idea the idea being that they would slowly build up a tolerance to said poison, and if someone actually tried to kill them with a dose of that poison, then they would be resistant to it. That, that would be the idea. And I think to some extent, I'm sure people, uh, when I say people, I mean humans, have have that kind of capacity. But for example, if it's, I don't know, whatever it might be, I don't know, arsenic. I don't know if you can build up a tolerance to arsenic but um, or cyanide or whatever. But even if even if it's, it's the case that you can, I don't think we'd all be like, well, we got plenty of arsenic around. It's always in our system. Why don't we just start eating arsenic, right? And that, that just wouldn't happen. And I guess one of the examples that was given in the book sort of talking about this was this this part of a, a weaponized gas. I don't know what exactly sort of gas it was, what part of the body acted on and all that, but it was used by uh, Saddam Hussein. Um, and I guess the, the part of the gas was something called DMMP. 
and that's about as much as I know about it. So uh, I'm sorry, I can't say more. But anyway, they had gone through this experimental process of uh, slowly exposing and regularly exposing uh, a fungus to DMMP. And eventually the fungus not only adapted to sort of put up with a DMMP, it also um, adapted and, and, and adaptation, I'm not really sure if it's a correct word in this situation, but anyway, it had learned to consume DMMP as sort of a main staple in its diet, so to speak. And that just, that's just so incredible. And of course, then there's all like these, um, you know, these implications about what that could mean as far as like the future of medicine. And this was hit, a, hit, and, uh, hit upon in much more detail and much more eloquently in the book. Um, but talking about how like it could be, for example, if we could feed like a fungus um, some kind of cell, right? For, I don't know, like let's say a cancer cell or whatever, and slowly and slowly and slowly uh, expose it to uh, the cancer cell over time or whatever, then the fungus would could possibly over, you know, relatively short period of time adapt and learn to actually either consume or produce some kind of, uh, what would you say, an antidote, so to speak, to sort of counteract that, that cell. And then, of course, then we could use that as people to fight off. And in this example given would be cancer. And it's just, you know, it's, it's uh, I mean, I'll leave it to you to react, how it, uh, react to that how you will, but really just uh, threw me for a loop. The thing that stood out to me the most is that we are, every single one of us, lichens. Mm. Now, uh, we can all relax. This isn't the lichen of the howling kind, but of the sort of, you know, the smushy interconnected mass of inter interdependent cellular uh, kind. Um, now, I, I suppose I'll, I'll start by asking, what do you know about lichens? Um, I have to confess uh, to knowing only slightly more than nothing. Um, just because I, I hike enough that I see them quite often and I look them up and then I learned what a lichen was in that sense. But uh, for the sake of review, a lichen is an organism consisting of both fungal and algal parts. And up until somewhat recently, I guess the general consensus was that lichens were, were thought to be basically like two, like a, a grouping of two parts only, right? So one part bacterial, um, or one part fungal and one part algal or algal. And so this is a very simple understanding. And it was, the understanding was always that it was a, it was sort of necessarily a beneficial relationship for the both of them, right? So necessarily some sort of symbiosis. It seems that like there can be, I don't know, this is probably an extreme over, an, over exaggeration, but there could be like 60 different species of mixes of, of fungi and algae living within one uh, at least our eyes, one body that would be classified as a lichen. And, and in, in this sort of reading about it, right, you come to learn that, for example, like mitochondria, uh, right, the powerhouse of the cell that we all learn back in biology class, used to be like an independent organism from our bodies. And at that time, we were sort of living as lichens did, right, like this sort of composite of bacteria and human and sort of now, I, I guess I, I say we to mean our long distant evolutionary ancestors, and I say did, but as we're sort of like increasingly learning, as we discover the connection between like ecosystems and, and uh, bacteria living within us and our own sort of microbiome with inside of us, it seems clear that like humans too are basically uh, lichens. And, and you know, and this is another thing, right? Like what I, what I talked about before when first reading about how there are relationships between between forests and, and, and fungus and stuff like that, um, that reading it, it's like, oh, wow, that's like, that's incredible. Um, I never thought about that before. But once you think about it, it's it's like it, it locks, something locks into place. You're like, oh, you know what, that, that, that makes so much sense. I, I suppose that all of this, uh, this long-winded sort of gushing about um, all this information that, that Merlin Sheldrake's the entangled life, not the entangled life. Entangled life brought to me what what it all comes to is that it just sort of really shocked me how how little um, I knew, and I imagine that uh, a lot of that is because sort of the 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 science around this and the studies and the research and all that around 
sort of fungus and and what they actually are and what they're actually doing is sort of i mean at least from like somebody like me who's just sort of absorbing this sort of science from a from a well fan seems like a strange way to put it but from an amateur point of view um that it seems like it's just really picking up now and so i imagine 20 years ago when i was in biology class it, it maybe it was not available or whatever but it just seems like it's so strange that these uh these creatures right like that seem to play such an incredible incredible uh important role in so many different things are so under taught um you know and it seems to me that like if it's not already the case that this is something that people should be learning about when they're in when they're in you know junior high school or high school um you know animals plants and then fungus should be treated with the same sort of um weight i think i mean it, it's not only it's not only like obviously like how important it is as far as like the the natural world of things but it's i think it's also there's so much mm, there's so much inside of uh, viewing fungus and what they're doing um, that we can sort of take lessons from, I guess. And I mean, you know, I think, I think generally speaking, the point of most things that we do as people is is uh, is with the a the end goal to improve lives for at the very least ourselves, but at at, at uh, you know in a higher sense maybe for for humanity in general, and so. I think probably like teaching people about fungus in that there's sort of the lesson about how even even the very very smallest tiniest thing is it's it's a part of something greater and it plays plays a role in a much greater system you know and and I think especially now like uh, with everything that we see around us happening um, politically and and I suppose much I don't suppose I think much more uh, urgently with what ha what is happening sort of uh, uh, with the changing of, of the planet one of one of the issues that we have as people is sort of forgetting about systems and how everything is important in a system it just seems like the general lack of interdependence on on other living things around us is the cause right now and I think it's important to say interdependence and not like one-sided dependence right which would be just sort of um draining of resources which i i think generally is what we're doing now but if we know that different species of plants connected by fungal networks help and nurture each other resulting in strong resilient forests greater ecosystems healthier crops and all of that like it seems like if we were to apply that to the human experience right and and we we could have like uh maybe help us realize that uh, I don't know, instead of always trying to, to fight against each other, right? Let's try to build into um, more systems of support and, and protection for not only the natural world, but also, you know, those who are outside of our world uh, culturally or, or whatever the case may be, that, it, that maybe we might actually get somewhere. And, and I think that was my main takeaway from, from reading... Uh, entangled life and sort of getting a much closer view of, of fungus was just like you know it all just seems so clear and simple right we have to act as as parts of a greater system and and learn to both depend more on others and also allow people not just people but but other other organisms to depend on us as well and i suppose that sounds a little bit soapboxy but i I mean, whatever. That's that's how I feel. So that is where we're going to end this, the second episode of The Distracted Gardener. I hope you found it interesting. Um, I would like to throw it over to you now and ask sort of uh, what do you know about um, fungus? If, if you're a gardener, for example, I would really like to know what sort of, well, a couple different things, like do you take any steps to sort of uh, improve the soil biome, for example, wherever you're gardening? Another one that it was really interesting um, that I thought of the other day uh, when a mushroom popped up in one of my in one of my containers um, is that I know like some of my gardening friends will immediately remove the mushroom. They'll just cut it out and they sort of have like a mini freak out because they think it's sort of bad for whatever's happening. Where on the other hand, I kind of think of it, it you know, it's just a fruiting body of whatever 
uh, fungus is growing throughout the soil. So I always thought it was kind of a, kind of a good sign, but I wonder what are your, what are your thoughts on that? And I'll leave that, uh, leave those two questions to you and I'll sign off here. Uh, we will be back next Monday. If you would like to read more or whatever, get into more contact with me, you can first visit naturalfukui.com. There are blog posts talking about gardening and hiking and a whole, a whole bunch of other things over there. Uh, you can also check me out at uh, Natural Fukui on both Twitter slash X, aka Twix. Uh, again, that's at Natural Fukui, or you can find me on Instagram at Natural Fukui. Uh, thanks for listening, and we will see you next Monday.